up for it right now, but I'm going to see if someone else can do it. I took off of my bike about 5 o'clock from my dorm. You know, I just sort of felt like going for a ride. So I headed up to the top of Cactus Canyon, and I'm not super familiar with that area, so on my way back down, I was just sort of picking the way to go. Which, now it makes me think that God wanted me to find him, because there was no way that I was going to go that way. So I was in some deep-ass sand, and you know, I wanted to turn around, but for some reason I just didn't. And I kept going, and there was this rock on the ground. You know, I just drilled it. I went over the handlebars and ended up on the ground. And I was just sort of picking myself up and dusting myself off when I noticed something, which ended up to be Matt. He was just, you know, sort of lying there by a fence. I, I thought it was a scarecrow. I was like, you know, Halloween's coming up. You know, thought it was a Halloween guy. So I didn't pay much attention to it. I got my bike and I walked around the fence that was there. It was a buck-type fence. And as I got closer to him, I noticed his hair. That was the major key to me realizing it was a human being was his hair. Because at first, honestly, I just, I just thought it was a dummy. I, I even noticed his chest, you know, moving up and down. I, I thought it was some kind of mechanism or something. But when I saw his hair, I, I realized it was a person. So, you know, I, I ran. I just I ran as fast as I could to the nearest house, and I called the police. I responded to the call. Reggie Flutie. But when I got there first, well, at first, the only thing I could see was partially somebody's feet. And I got out of my vehicle and raced over. I'd seen what appeared to be a young man, uh, 13, 14 years old, because he was so tiny, lying on his back. And he was tied to the bottom end of a pole. I did the best I could. The gentleman that was lying on the ground was Matthew Shepard. He was covered in dry blood all over his head. There was dry blood underneath him. He was barely breathing. He doing the best he could. I was going to breathe for him, and I couldn't get his mouth open. His mouth wouldn't open for me. He was covered in, like I said, partially dry blood and blood all over his head. <coughs> the only place where he did not have any blood on him was what appeared to be where he had been crying down his face. His head was distorted. You know, it did not look normal. It looked like he had a real harsh head wound. I was working in the emergency room the night Matthew Shepard was brought in. I'm not sure that any of us can remember seeing a patient in such a condition for a very long time. Those of us who've worked in big city hospitals have seen this, but there's some of us who haven't worked in big city hospitals, and it's not something you expect here. You expect to see these injuries from a car going down a hill at 80 miles per hour. You expect to see these gross injuries from something like that, this horrendous, terrible thing. You don't expect to see these injuries from one person doing this to another. It's not something you expect here. The ambulance reports that was a beating, so we know. There was nothing that I could do. I mean, if there was anything that I could have done to help him or save him, I would have done it, but there was nothing. And I was sitting there yelling at the top of my lungs, you know, just trying to get something out of him, like, hey, hello, wake up! But he didn't move. He didn't flinch. He didn't anything. He was tied to the fence. His hands were tied, uh, thumbs out, what we call a cuffing <coughs> position, we handcuff people. And he was bound with a real thin white rope. It went around the bottom of the pole, got uh, about four steps up off the ground. His shoes were missing. He was tied extremely tight. So I tried to use my boot knife and I tried to slip it between the rope and his wrist. I had to be extremely careful not to harm Matthew any further. Your first thought is, well, certainly you'd like to think that somebody else that comes through town and beats somebody. Well, things like this happen, you know, shit happens happens in Laramie. But when someone's been beaten repeatedly, it's certainly something that offends us. I think that's a good word for it. It offends us. He was bound so tight, I, I finally got my knife through there. I'm sorry. Um, rolled him over on his left side, and when we did that, he quit breathing. Uh, immediately, I put him back on his back, and that was just enough of an adjustment. It gave him enough room to kind of breathe there. I had seen the EMS unit trying to get to the location. Once the ambulance got there, we put a neck collar on him, placed him on a backboard, and scooted him from underneath the fence. <coughs> then Rob drove the ambulance to Ivinson's Hospital's emergency room. Now the strange thing is, 20 minutes before Matthew Shepard arrived, Aaron McKinney was brought in by his girlfriend. And I guess he got into a fight later on that night back in town. So I'm working on Aaron, and the ambulance comes in with Matthew. 
Now at this point I don't know there's any connection at all, so I tell Aaron to wait and I go and help treat Matthew. So there's Aaron in one room of the ER, and Matthew in another room, two doors down. And when we first saw Matthew, it was clear to us that his care was beyond our capabilities. We called the neurosurgeon in Poudre Valley Hospital and he was on the road in an hour and 15 minutes, I think. They show me a picture. Days later, they show me a picture of Matthew. I would have never recognized him. Two days later, I found out the connection. And I was very struck. They were two kids. They were both my patients, and they were two kids. I treated both of them, both their bodies. And for a brief moment, I wondered if this is how God feels when he looks down at us. How are all his kids? Our souls? Our bodies? I felt a great deal of compassion for the both of them. 